Curtis, what's up, brother? Not much, man. How about you? Doing well. Thanks for uh, for coming on the Athletes Podcast, or we had a little issue there. No problem. No problem. Yeah, I swear I got a Google thing. I was confused. I was sitting in a Google meet, and it said the Athletes Podcast. I was like, wait, what's going on? Oh, that's my bad. I uh, I, I probably just sent the calendar invite, and uh, oh, just uh, gotcha. You know, so many platforms, so much going on. You know, you're up, you're grinding all the time, right? So confusing. So many freaking platforms. <laughs> Dude, how was uh, how was a couple hours of skating this morning? It was it was great. Um, uh, pretty tired, but uh, it's stuff I just got to do. I got to be constantly touching the puck, constantly, uh, you know, doing things like. I'm not a, not a skilled guy, right? So I got to constantly be doing skill things, picking up pucks with my feet, just constantly, you know, continuous, consistent puck touches that, that I can get that nine out of 10, that eight out of 10 when I'm in a game. You know what I mean? You got to be at that high level all the time. Totally. Yeah. And obviously, you know, you bring up, you're not a skilled guy. You're still signing a contract in the NHL last mm-hmm. night with the San Jose Sharks. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. How uh, how are you feeling after that? Because that was a long, long process, you know, free agency, quarantine, coming back home to Canada from dealing with COVID for however long it's been now, eight months. How uh, how was that process? How how patient did you have to be? Yeah, it was totally different than any other time I've gone through it. I've gone through it two other times. Uh, really, the biggest difference is my perspective on it. Uh, the past two times, I was a hockey player. That's what I am. That's who Curtis Gabriel is. I'm just a hockey player, nothing else. Uh, And obviously, you know, that was, you know, had a lot more, you know, kind of a lot more weight to it. Uh, I was lucky to sign early on both days, like within the first hour. Um, But this time going in, I knew that the situation teams uh, were very uh, cautious. They don't want to spend money that, you know, it's just kind of all up in the air. So I had a new agent. I hired Gold Star Hockey, Dan Milstein, Keith McKittrick, and uh, they let me be super involved in the, in the process. So I kind of knew what was going on every step of the way. Um, I knew I kind of had that old mentality for a little bit. Now I've, I've learned and grown that I'm not just a hockey player. I'm a good person first and I choose to play hockey. I choose to put my body on the line. I choose to do these things. Um, so it was weird. I had the fridge, free agency started and everybody knew it was going to be slow, but to not like kind of hear anything, I had to kind of, you know, it was a test of my new med perspective and mentality. I was a little, you know, quiet, a little more not my, myself for a couple hours. And I went, hey, talk to my mom, talk to my girlfriend, support system. Boom, back on track the next day. Oh, whatever happens, whatever happens, I'll make the best of it regardless. And then, you know, the, the, the interest would go up and down. And then re- late last two weeks picked up a lot, which was great. And uh, I got to go to my number one choice. So I definitely had to be patient, but it's perspective more than anything that helped. Yeah, it's, it's so cool. I was uh, just doing my research for this. And, you know, one of the things you talk about is doing that uh, Jordan Peterson self-authoring program. You went through that. You have those support net- networks like your girlfriend and your mom. So excuse me. And how, how important was that process going through that, especially in a time like this when, you know, you don't you didn't know what was going on next and you had to write 16,000 words to talk about who you are as a human being outside of a hockey player? Yeah. So first and foremost, what I've learned um, over the time, I took my time kind of making this decision, but I don't support all of Jordan Peterson's views. I think he's kind of a, uh, I have to say this every time I talk about him now, he's not as nice as he could be. He has some, he has some interesting ways of of saying that it's not about the pronouns. It's about the speech law. So I'll, I'll go start by saying that, you know, at the time I didn't really was aware of this. So I did do this program and it's uh it's something that my brother recommended. It's probably the best thing my brother's ever done for me. We got the two for one special they have on there. You do it together. You keep each other accountable. And uh, I did the past authoring first. And I came home after another season, uh, sorry, a season in the AHL, which I never got a game up. And it was not anywhere close to what I wanted to happen. And I was kind of, uh, I was, I was, you know, I had some trauma over that in my mind. I was a little upset. I was a little down. Um, I know I'm good enough. I know I should be here. I knew I should have got opportunity, but I was worrying about things I couldn't control. Life's not fair. And it took me way too many times. So what this first part of the process was, was past authoring. And what it did for me was I wrote my whole autobiography. And like you said, 16,000 words, you know, your stuff. Um, And it uh, totally laid out my whole, you know, life for me in my own words. You know, it was, I, I identified patterns, um, in my thought process, where I started to get off track at 17, you know, even down to the nitty gritty stuff of relationships with women, um, where it could have been better, what could have gone, you know, what went wrong. And then from there too, just the five times I identified it, I catastrophic, catastrophically 
worried about something I could not control and the negative effects it had on my life. Now, from the outside, people are probably just like, oh, he's trying his best. He's trying to make the NHL. He's getting there. He's been up there. He's, you know, but to me, it was like, no, like, there's, if I don't make it, I'll die. I'll spontaneously combust. So to put that out in front of me, now realize I'm not a hockey player. I'm a human being, first and foremost. That was a huge, like, eye-opener to me. And it's something that people were telling me for years. And all the cliches are true, but I just didn't want to listen because I'm stubborn. So it was an incredible process. Um, I, I did the, and then I did the present and the, the present good things and bad things in my personality. And then I'm still doing the future part as I kind of craft what I want out of the future. So, I, I mean, I'm trying to find something now that is equivalent that wasn't run by Jordan Peterson, but everybody needs to do this in their life. And bar none, it's, it's like a, it's just a, a must. Yeah, it's a. I, I was telling Jordan previously, who's the uh, the producer for the podcast, and explaining the process. And I think it's something he and I might go through together. It'd be a cool one to do. Um, but it, it's interesting. You bring up the relationships with women, for example, and that's something that athletes deal with. You know, you're a you're a public figure. You're a celebrity. You're involved. People tend to like to be able to associate with you. Um, one of the questions uh, that I feel like you know a lot of people now with you on social media being active with who you are, a lot of the questions that uh, maybe someone doesn't want to ask is how the heck do you land an IG model like your girlfriend? Uh, how do you get a, how, how are you constantly dealing with the, uh, the, the barrage of males that are commenting on her pictures and doing all that? Like what's, what goes into that? Yeah. Well, I mean, to me, it's honestly like, it's like water off a duck's back. Cause I'm that personality, you know, I'm like, yeah. I'm not, I play hockey because I grew up in Ontario. If I grew up in Louisiana, I'd been a quarterback. I would have think that's the coolest thing around. I've, I want what's desirable. That's, I, I love that. So when I see someone that's super desirable like her, and then, wow, we end up talking, and, wow, she's an amazing person. She's actually an angel and doesn't portray that at all online. I'm just like, I mean, it's just exactly it's something I love. She's goals and all that stuff herself. So for me, it's nothing. But now that I've found out, it takes a certain type of person to date someone like that. Uh, her ex has had trouble with it, um, didn't go well with them. So I just find it's really funny. Like, why would you even want to get in a relationship with someone uh, if you can't handle that stuff, if you're going to be insecure? And now I used to be insecure about things. I'm not going to sit here and say I've been, you know, secure my whole life. The last like eight months, I've really figured it out. I met her like at the beginning of that eight months and we've kind of figured it out together. She was in a, you know, a place that she didn't want to be as well. So honestly, just own your shit. That's what I would say. Like, that's the yeah. number one thing. If you can't own your shit, people see right through that. And, uh, I mean, a girl like that's not good. She's not going to put up with that. Like she, <laughs> one of the earliest things she said to me when we started dating, she was like, yeah, I cannot deal with an insecure person. Like it's just, there's enough too hard to deal with in life as it is. And I was like, huh? Yeah. So I like got my ass moving on making sure that I am now like, you could literally chirp me about anything. You could say anything you want about her, me, like, I literally don't care because it's like, I love having fun and engaging back and forth. And it's so funny to chirp back and actually try to, like, spread love to people hating on me. I'm like, why are you, why are you, why are you hating? Because if you hate people, you're projecting your hate. But, uh, yeah, I just have a lot of fun with it now. Yeah, it's hilarious. Well, and you share, you know, the similar mentality to like, Gary Vaynerchuk. You're like, man, post your shit. Do whatever you want. Social media, it's yeah. fun, entertaining, right? I, I love it. And, like, you know, following along, I was doing, again, the research going through your socials, you're, you went on a 21 day meal challenge. You were going through eating clean, healthy. You're still going through the trough every day, uh, grinding through it with Phenon doc. How's that going? Uh, it's, it's great, man. I love how dialed in you are on this. You know, this is the, like the most dialed in I've, I've interviews been on all my social stuff. So I appreciate that. It shows me that what I'm putting out is being received the way I want to, especially by guys that are similar to me, like yourself. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I've always had like bowel troubles and I didn't think anything of it. I just thought like I eat a ton. I train a ton. You know, when you, when you stress your body a lot, you know, you're going to have upset stomach or, and you eat a lot. You're going to, you know what I mean? So I was always just like, whatever. Um, but then I started to figure out like, that's not how it's supposed to go. Like I researched yeah. stool and like how it's supposed to be. And like, you, you got to talk about shit. It's important. And literally um, no pun intended, literally, literally very important. Like I've learned like the gut, your gut health is directly linked to your brain. Like it's a weird correlation that no, not many people know about, but, um, I basically have tried every diet under the sun. Um, I've tried being 200 pounds and 6%. I've tried being 230 and 12%. And now I've found that 215, eight to 9% is my ideal range. So I knew, figured that out. I know that I'm a high carb guy. I can't eat other, any other way. I'm an ectomorph body type. I'm a, more of an endurance guy than a power guy. 
so I figured all these things out and now I was like, okay, hey, I need to like, I've done sensitivity tests before with food, but I need to do like a real, like a full one. Like I need to invest in it. So I forked up the money, it's two grand. Um, you know, you get four months of follow-ups, you get the full testing kind of thing. And then a couple meetings with them. So what I found is that, uh, you know, wheat, gluten, uh, sorry, wheat, eggs and dairy are just super high for me. They set my body off and that my hormone levels were just like, the fact he, we actually talked about like, the fact you're doing this much with your hormones at literally operating at like 57% is like crazy. He's like, the fact that you can compete at that high level, that you're crushing the bike the way you do all these things, like. He's like, dude, we could like get you leveled up like three, four times. And I'm like, dude, are you kidding me? Like, I remember I said in the thing, I was like, I just want to be shredded by this guy. I want to, I want him to totally say I suck at nutrition so I can get better. And um, so he goes like, there's like a graph. So here's like the line and you want to be you know, like right above at this top of this green line. And I was down here at the bottom fringe. If I had dropped another 10 points, I'd be like, my body would be killing my own muscle basically. And I've always had problems being an ectomorph narrow shoulders, tall endurance body type, putting on muscle mass. And if I gain muscle mass, I gain a lot of fat because my, my hormones are off. So we're trying to dial that in now. My stomach was great for, I'd say two weeks. Now I've started to have some, like, maybe I've gone sensitive the other way because your body gets used to things. So I can't wait to talk to him. How many, how many days left a week left to see if I can start reintroducing things and balance myself off. Cause it's almost like I've eaten too strict now and my stomach's been a little off lately. So I, I you know, it's kind of like a little bit of a dance and it's frustrating, but for a while there, there's a major difference. And I was felt absorbing all my food and you have to eat the extra 500 calories to stay the same weight. Yeah. I've got a call with them on Saturday. Actually, I'm, you know, with everything that I'm doing with the podcast, trying to become a better athlete as well, interviewing athletes, I got to reap what I sow. Right. So I, uh, when I found out you were doing, it, I'm like, man, I got to get on that. I, I, I bought that Diffelmeyer rye bread made with sunflower uh, seeds and crushed that yesterday. Past How do you days. like that? How do you like Dude, it? It's a, it's not bad. Actually, you toss a little natural peanut butter. It's okay. Toast it up. Like, you know, first couple was uh it's a little, it's different. It's not normal yes. bread. Yes. I, first times I ate it, I was just like, I'm not even going to toast this crap. It's going to be bad either way. I'm just going to eat it out of the bag. And people thought that was hilarious. I don't know why, but <laughs> I do that with a lot of things. I just shove it down my throat, but you have to, for me, I have to toast it like medium. If you toast it too hard, it becomes like a rock. It's yeah, like chewing it's gravel. gravel. <laughs> yeah, you can't eat that. It's like chewing gravel. So it's like I, I have to toast it and I have to like pay attention so that I can actually, and then it's so much more enjoyable. Yeah, it's uh, so I posted it on my Insta yesterday, just uh, throwing it out there. I figured I'd do it right before we chatted, uh, have some fun nice, with dude. it. I love that. <clears throat> um, so let's, let's talk a bit about hockey and, you know, how you've become a player now. You, this is your fourth organization playing in the National Hockey League. And um, you, you started off, 16, 17 years old, you were with the OHL, the attack. Um, what was it like playing in Owen Sound with such a, a, an established franchise? And you had some boys on there, that team, guys that I'm familiar with, Jared Maidens, Devin Rimantruck, uh, obviously Binner, Jordan Bennington, to name a stud in the NHL now. What, uh, what was that team like? Yeah, it's crazy. Andrew Shaw, Garrett Wilson, you know, yeah. Mike Halmo, like so many guys, you know, teams win a championship, a lot of guys end up playing in the NHL, right? But yeah. Uh, for me, just to sneak on that team, I literally snuck on that team with the last spot as a free agent. Uh, I wasn't like the sixth overall pick like Maids, and I wasn't like a freaking truck like Reimer when I was younger. <laughs> so I just walked on there. I crushed the beat test uh, to, and then caught their attention and then got played physical and just snuck on that team. And I was just happy to be there. But that quickly turned to like shitty because I didn't play the whole year. It was kind of like a dark year. I just had to get my high school done and get ready for next year. But a small town place that's so established like you're saying um can't do anything in the community without getting noticed so you you learn to be a pro pretty quick on and off the ice um they only brought in you know for the most part some people slip through the cracks but good people there uh only people that work hard pretty much a uh, certain type of human being uh, i think they've been pretty good with that over the years it's hard um but yeah it's also because a lot of freaking high-end skill guys don't want to go to play in Owen Sound and it makes no sense and then you see a guy a good human being like Nick Suzuki go there and shred it for four years. I don't know why anybody wouldn't want to go play there. Victor Mete, like all these freaking guys that like, got, like just went and played for London. It's ridiculous. Um, so it was incredible. Um, did not expect to be playing there. And uh, I remember me and my mom drove up like two months before the training camp and had a pizza by the water. And we're like, you might play here. Just, I was just a free agent. And it's funny how now that my mom lives up there, you know, we spread my grandmother's ashes up there. We're so tied to the place. I'm going up there this weekend. 
That, that's amazing. And it's, uh, it's, it's cool, you know, you mentioning Rimmer as a big truck at the back, but that's some of the, one of the things that's unique about the OHL is the sense that there's guys that have specific priorities as to where they want to go. It doesn't matter. Like they have their sights set on playing for London, playing for the Knights, playing for the Ice Dogs for us in Niagara here. Like how, uh, how what, I don't, I don't know how to wrap my head around that. Like what would be, you know, if your decision process, you're in junior, right? Like why, why not just go enjoy the experience, go where whoever wants you. I mean, it's just the whole mentality, right? So I can't, you know, I should probably, it could be great guys. And I put, if I put myself in their shoes and I had the option to play in an NHL type building with NHL fans in the bigger city, like that is for, I can mm-hmm. see where it's coming from, but now where, what I know with how I approach life, I kind of unknowingly still did it back then is like, it's going to, ha- things are going to happen for a reason. I truly believe that. If you don't believe that you're going to live a freaking miserable life. So I just think you embrace anything that happens and you make the most of it. And that's going to be your path and your journey. Like, so, you know, if I'm, a, if I'm Jared Maiden, you know, Oh, I'm from Grimsby. Where the hell's Owen sound? Why'd I got to go up there? Maiden is a great human being. So he didn't care. He said, Oh, you want to take me the highest? I want to go whoever wants to take me the highest. And he came up there and he was a stud scored the game seven OT winner in the, for the, to go to the Mem cup. So, that just shows you like everything has to reason. Now, you know, he probably would have, if he went to some other team, he might've career might've ended the same way. You know, it's unfortunate what happened and it's freaking hurts you every time you talk to him. It's brutal. But I, I believe in just running at your passion and your dream, like not trying to control it too much. That's what I try to do now. I, I used to in the past. So. Okay. So it brings up a good point. And Maidens is someone who I went to school with. I met him in first year. So in 2015, came out to Brock from BC. I had no idea who this guy was. He's a specimen built like a Mack truck, right? Just ripped, shredded. <laughs> and, <me> <laughs> right? So I play golf with him, whatever, uh, over the past couple of years, but man, I had no idea how, what the high level of hockey that that guy played and zero clue. So I've been friends with him for four years now. And just recently it came to light. I had a couple of buddies like, man, you know, like he's a legit athlete. I'm like, I had zero <laughs> idea. The, the most humble guy I've, probably ever met in my life and he comes in and like that just uh, without any so I'm like man we got to talk about your experience and going through that on the podcast so we're going to chat in the future but what like what was he like for you obviously you got to see him firsthand play how good was he dude <laughs> it's like I had a buddy Kevin Pangos he plays for a lot of money over in Russia now he's trying to get to the NBA basketball player and we had to tell Kevin high school man you got to get more like you can be the nicest valedictorian Zach Efron of the high school, but when you get on the court, you need to be a fucking killer, like enough of the crap. So we would just rebound the ball, feed it to him, rebound the ball, Kev, be cocky, step off the court, chill. Maiden's never had that problem, in my opinion. He always knew when to be a good guy, and he played hard on the ice, dude, hard. So um, I was very impressed by that. I, you know, I'm 17 coming in. I sneak on as a free agent. He comes in as a sixth overall pick already shredded looks like he's 20 <laughs> and he's playing like second line with Hachilis and Mignardi two overagers and uh, like he could have played on first line like he, he's that good of a hockey player he's that good of a person he's a perfect fit for Owen Sound uh he loved his billets they're like his second family no surprise there um but yeah he just he's a guy that was always actually I go into the into this into the room and he'd always be stretching he hurt his hip it's like first 20 games and he always stretched from then on and, and I always have to go join me in his stretching sessions. He was like a, ahead of the game as far as preparation and work ethic, but he had that like freak strength and freak skill to match it. He had the longest stick ever. I always chirped him. I was like, how do you stick handle that thing? <laughs> That's awesome. Well, it, it'll be cool to, to talk with him about it because, you know, I'm still learning about him. The, it's interesting you bring up basketball, your buddy. Uh, you played hockey, basketball, baseball, volleyball, frisbee growing up. Um, and you almost considered going down to the States on a basketball scholarship. Uh, what, how did you make that decision to continue with hockey is kind of specialize in that sport? Yeah, that always cracks me up because Pangos and his mom, I think she was a teacher at the school always said like, Oh, I could play like college basketball if I wanted, but I thought they meant CIS. So I, there's no way I was going to pro basketball <laughs> down there, maybe like a D3 school. I was the same basketball player as I am a hockey player. I just did all the dirty work, <laughs> rebound freaking run down the quarter million miles an hour and brick a freaking layup off the backboard. Like I was that guy. So I like their, they liked how hard I worked and all that stuff. But um, hockey didn't become a, a realistic thing until I turned uh, till 16. So like the OHL draft year, I was uh, playing double a um, my whole 
for since 10 years old. My, my dad, when I was 10 years old, got me a release from a bunch of different teams. New York Simcoe Express were too good of a team where I'm from a new market. I went to play for the Richmond Hill Stars where Bennington's from. And I made that team with Barkley Goodrow. And they said like, hey, you're going to be our go-to guy with Barkley Goodrow. And uh, I was like, great. I'm a AAA player. Dad believes in me. Let's go. And then my dad took his own life. So then all my hockey confidence went away, gone. Uh, I played like four fine minutes. I don't know how you even do that at 10 years old. I thought they just broke the line, <laughs> but I guess not. Um, and my mom was just like, didn't know anything about hockey at the time. She's a volleyball, basketball, soccer player. She pulled me out, went back home to Newmarket, and played double A, single A. Um, so when I got to that, that OHL draft year, I was like the captain of my double A team, but nobody scouts double A, especially in Newmarket. Yeah. Um, playing my butt off, having so much fun, thinking I'm going to go play major midget the next year. And then all these guys from my team start trying out for the, the tier two team, the Newmarket Hurricanes. My mom was like, they're going to try out. You're just as good as them. Why don't you go try out? I'm like, okay, uh, sure. She's like, it's 50 bucks. Go for it. I'm like, okay. And from there, I just, I seemed to every try out I went to, I stood out for whatever reason. Um, I, I, they said, they said they couldn't take me right away. Uh, Cause I just can't, they can't go double A to junior A. They said, go play major midget triple A. I did that in Markham. Then I started to play a bit more physical signed with the junior A. went back to the trials the next year, made that team was like, hallelujah. Mom's crying. Oh my God. I'm going to go to, junior A and I'm going to go to a scholarship on hockey. My mom doesn't have to pay for school. Wow. And um, then I'm at a junior C skate. The junior A team said, go skate at this uh, junior C tryouts. It's their tryouts. And I'm like, all right, I love, I love competing. Let's go. So I just go up. I act like, I act like the whole NHL scouts are there when they're not. I just like to compete. That's what I do. So I yeah. go out. I think I have three goals in this scrimmage with their thing. I broke a guy's nose, a guy that also is funny. His name's Curtis. And I played with growing up at double A. Um, so I was just like barking at him, still going off the ice. And one of the Owen Sound attack scouts just happened to be there watching his son's friend, Joel Hanley, who played on the stars in the Stanley Cup final. And he's just like, Hey, you want to come try for the attack? I'm like, okay. Like what? <laughs> like, and um, we laughed about it on the way home and my mom. And then he actually called us the next day. He's like, no, this is legit. So if that didn't happen, I'm just, you know, I guess going to school. I don't know how it goes from there, but that kind of, when, when I all of a sudden was on an OHL team at 17, I was like, okay, like, I guess this is a real thing. And that's where my mentality changed. I went up there as a free agent. I was like, I have nothing to lose. I still got a junior A team to go back. I'm just going to play my ass off, see what happens. And then I made that team and I felt like I had expectation now. And I put those on myself and I got to do this. I got to make the NHL. And from that age to 26.8, eight months ago, that's what I thought. But now I'm back to that mentality of let's, let's go again. So like, let's just compete no matter what. That's what I have to do. So it's, it's crazy ride from 16 to 27, man. It's crazy. Yeah, I, I can believe it. Um, and it, it's, that's kind of interesting because you, I think probably part of those expectations come from, you know, you make that team, you're playing for Owen Sound, you're 17 years old. And then in your first two years of drafts, you, d you don't get drafted. So, you know, there's, you know, that's always lingering over your head. You're like, am I going to get drafted? What's happening? X, Y, Z. And then the wild come around in the third round, 81st overall, they draft you. You go to that organization, you sign a three-year deal. Um, how, how cool, how rewarding or how amazing was that to get hear your name called in the NHL draft? Yeah. First of all, why the hell was I expecting to get drafted? You know what I mean? Like, it was almost like, where, where did I just come from? Like that, mm. looking back, the mentality was terrible. Like I should have, what really, what really got me thinking about that more is that I got invited off 40 games played of three shifts a game to the Phoenix Coyotes at the time's training camp. Mm. And I barely played and I got to go to an NHL camp and made the t first two rounds of cuts to main camp. And Jeff Tui, who I still talked to today, was like, they should have signed you back then. Cheap deal got you in the organization. I'm like, I'm a freaking NHL prospect. And I went back all hot shit, had a terrible season. Terrible. Like, thought, oh, God, it was bad. Got beat up 10 times or nine out of 10 times in my started fighting. Bad. And I had to go home in my tail between my legs and then came back and ba went back to just, hey, just make the team and just compete. And I get drafted. So it just shows you, like, you can't have those expectations, man. It's just the worst thing for you. You have to be so elite to be able to handle like a, you know, McKinnon McDavid to be that good and that touted. That's crazy. Um, but to, to then go get drafted in the NHL and be at the draft and like go do the whole thing was nuts coming from where I came from three years earlier. I was a double a hockey player that had like <laughs> yeah. just no interest in hot. Like I thought I was just like going to go to school and just be a normal, like a normal kid going to school. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's funny. Trevor Parks, who was on the podcast, uh, I can't remember episode 30 something. Um, but he went through a similar situation, was playing junior C, junior B, and then the next year walks on to the Red Wings organization, right? It just happens. Sometimes things click. Uh, but you mentioned getting beat up. 
uh, you, you fill a role that that's, you know, part of sometimes what's going to happen, right? You're, uh, you're, you're in a role of an enforcer, among other things on the ice, uh, sitting at 6'3", 6'4", 215, 220. Uh, not a small guy by any means. Um, but you're taking on guys like Lucic, Reeves, freaking, uh, who, who else? Zach Cassian. Like, those are monsters in the NHL. And those are big boys, uh, full-grown men that have been in there playing, going against guys like how, are you ever uh, a little nervous going in there or do you just go in full confidence and know that uh, you got to rely on your abilities? Yeah. Uh, it's weird. Like it just never, you know, you didn't fight growing up. You know, I, I didn't think like I talked to somebody recently who I played double way with back then. He, I said, I wasn't really that physical. He said, yeah, you crush somebody every once in a while, but not really. I was like, yeah, I didn't really like do that. So it's weird how obviously you have to adapt or die. And I felt like it's something that comes like natural to me. I'm not, I've never been a street fight off the ice but I've like always just been a super intense guy. So when emotion and it was super emotional, so when that boils over, there you go. So I, I had to kind of force it for a little bit to kind of go mm -hmm. to the boxing, go get beat up 10 times to kind of learn. But then after that, it started to become a, like more of a confidence thing. And um, I, I started to relish it a lot more. Obviously, if you have to fight like three games in a row and your hands are hurting, that sucks. But overall, it's like, wow, like this is something – I, I've always been that person to, like, I, I'm not tooting my own heart. I just stand up to, like, a bully. I've always been that person to, like, do that. It just came naturally to me. So, it's like, why wouldn't I take care of my teammates, you know? So, uh, it was kind of an interesting organic progression. That's how all things happen in my life. I just be myself, go at what I want, and organically something good will come out of it. And that's really what it came down to. So, to fight those guys, I mean, Lucic was a guy that I've looked up to. He's the answer, I would say, for years about who I wanted to be like. And to fight him was nuts. Um you know, at least I was at a decent, I was 215 when I fought him and he's like 235. <laughs> when I fought Reeves, I was 197 pounds. I was trying to be like super light and fast. And I had my middle finger stitched together straight. I couldn't bend it. So I couldn't throw with my right hand. I was like, had to eat punches and throw with my left. So <laughs> that's where my confidence comes from. It's like, I fought those guys with not a good hand and I was too, way lighter than them. And uh, so I can't wait to go. I mean, I just signed with San Jose. So <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I pretty much told them and, you know, I think it goes without saying, like, I'm going to be, every time we're going to be playing Vegas, LA, or Anaheim, I'm going to be going after Reeves, McDermott, and Deloria. It's just on repeat. And then I'll terrorize Arizona. I'll tear my buddy Lawson Kraus, <laughs> as I train with. He doesn't really want to fight too much. Uh, but that's, that's my role. So I just hope I can get up there and be that guy for the team. I, I would uh, want nothing more than that. Yeah, uh, the GM of the Sharks, uh, Doug Wilson, stated, Gabriel brings something to a team a lot of guys don't, and that is those intangibles you can't find anywhere else. He brings a toughness and a physicality that a team lacks. When he hits a player on the ice, he leaves his presence. Gabriel has good hands and very defensively responsible on his own end. And, like, that's, that's high praise. Dude, I didn't even know he said that. So where did you find that? Like, I, I, I mean, I talked on the phone, but I saw his press release from my agent was like, not as complimentary as that. So you got to send me that right after because I would love uh, to see that again. 100%, 100% I'll share it over to you. But it's, uh, I think that's, it's a testament to what you've done over the past, you know, five, six, seven years in that, in the NHL. And, you know, you make your presence known. And you've also branded yourself as, as this good human off the ice as well. And uh, I, that's one of, one of the things I want to bring to light to you. You've got the LGBTQIA plus as well as your yep. ally, uh, as well as your ally shirt there. Um, talk a bit about what you're doing off the ice to, to try and bring light to these uh, social situations and even as a mental health advocate as well. Yeah. So first and foremost, like everybody's got different personalities. So just like we talked about, I naturally progressed to being a tough guy. I've naturally progressed to standing up for people in marginalized, oppressed communities. It's just become part of who I am now um as I said before I did it in high school kind of unknowingly or growing up I was always that like kind of like justice guy uh, mm -hmm. so it's weird obviously it's like a natural organic you know progression it's still weird to sit here to this day like the other times I signed contracts my phone didn't blow up like it just did yesterday mm. like you know why that is because I have this amazing community that is welcomed me in that I'm in the fight with them and the love I get back is insane so it just doesn't sit right with me that people are looked at and judged on anything but their character, kindness, compassion, work ethic, perseverance, determination, go all the way down the adjectives. That's the only thing we should be judging anybody on. I'm so sick of like hearing stories of people judged by their skin color, by their religion. But like, it's just like, man, there's bad people in every community. 
There's not one proportionate community that has more bad people. If anything, it's white people. Like, but it's <laughs> definitely not those ones. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, we yeah. need to figure it out. So it just doesn't sit well with me. And uh, I'm, I'm not trying to fix the world all at once. I can't. I'm an ally. I'm a, I'm a um, amplifier. I'm a humanizer. I'm not the one that's going to be at the forefront of these things. I just want to be a part of it. I want to be part of the right side of history when people look back and say, hey, I stood up and started doing something. And it took me too long, to be honest. When Colin Kaepernick stood up, that should have woken me up back then. Uh, so we all, we all are a little slow to it. Um, there's nothing wrong with being wrong, accepting that and planting your tree now and moving forward. So it just, it just makes sense to me. It's part, it's as much as like, it's become as much as like breathing. You stand up for things that are right. It's not that hard. You, everybody can feel what's right and wrong in them. It's just whether or not you've got the nuts to do something about it. Like that's my opinion. Yeah. Well, and you, you became the first NHL player to use pride tape outside of the designated pride nights. Um, you've earned the IQA uh, American Specialty AHA, AHL, sorry, Man of the Year Award twice for two different organizations um, for your outstanding contributions uh, that you do off the ice. And, you know, it's, it's, it's so cool to see because, you know, on one end, you've got this big, huge, tough guy, hockey player that's, you know, the guys, everyone's worried about beating them up in the parking lot, whatever. And then on the other hand, you're this ally, nice guy that's on Instagram talking to people and sharing your stories. Like, it's, it's really cool. So kudos to you on that. Um, Thank you. One of the things I, I also have to bring up is uh, Luke Gazdick, who I'm sure you're likely familiar with. He was an enforcer in the NHL as well. Played for the Devils, actually, too. Um, but he was episode 49 as well as number 26, good friend of the Athletes podcast. Um, but he brings up one of the, the notions of the enforcer and the fact that, you know, you're putting your body on the line every single time you go out on the ice. And that might be only for the 30 seconds where you go and have to throw hands with someone, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's an extremely rewarding position uh, in the sense that you, at the end of the day, you're doing that for your, the other boys on it that are wearing that jersey as well. Um, how, how do you approach that situation and how do you get yourself psyched up game after game? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, he's a large human being. He's one of these <laughs> monsters you talk about, which, you know, I, I guess I kind of am. I'm at the low end of the monsters. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm fighting up most of the time. So he's one of those guys that I think I've played against, but I fought Sabrin instead. But hmm. if, I mean, if he's still playing, I don't know if he played this year, but he might be out West coast next year. I might have to fight him in the minors. I don't know, but great dude. I heard nothing but great things about him. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I mean, I, I do really like it. I take pride. I don't think you can do it and not take pride. You can't do it and hate it. So that's first and foremost. Um, I think there's just a huge role for it. Like it just, it, the game is just different. If one team has a guy like that, the other team doesn't, the game's just different. So I just don't uh, see why you wouldn't have one of those guys. Uh, I almost like lick my chops when the other team doesn't <laughs> have one because I can just do whatever the hell I want. Now, yeah. I try to do it regardless of who's playing, but then I have to be – there's all these, like, intricacies that come into this role that people don't realize. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's funny. People always think we're the idiots, and I guess that's from movies like Goon and all that stuff. But if you really, like, know anything about hockey, we're usually the more intelligent guys. Yeah, yeah, dude. We uh, – you know, growing up, you I play with guys who, are, you know, fit that role, and it's funny because a lot – everyone assumes that they're just the meathead, but it's the other end of the spectrum, like you said, right? Um, <clears throat> the – one of the other notes is like, how do you go from, like you said, that mentality of eight months ago where you were down, you were, you had all this pressure and other than the self authoring and having that support network, was there anything in particular that you did to, to really just change that mentality? Were you waking up every day being grateful? Did you do anything in your day-to-day -day life that changed? Yeah. Like those things for sure. The self authoring really like kicked it to another level. Um, but I don't know, man. I think probably the biggest thing is like knowing that I'm never going to figure it out. Like I'm never mm. going to master this. Cool. So that's a thing. I think that's a huge perspective shift that I catch myself all the time. Uh, I remember being in the lunchroom in mini 23. I'd already played, I think the month up in the NHL that year. And I'm down there and our player development guys there. And we're talking about like making bagels. And I'm like, you know what? I got it now. Like I got it. I, and he's like, Oh yeah. And I'm like, yeah, like I, I got it. And he's like, hmm, all right. And then looking back to that, I'm like, you, what an idiot. I sounded <laughs> like. You know, like, what do I, who am I to say I got it at 23? I was just trying to bravado myself to get back into the NHL, right? But I, I truly yeah. thought that too. But 
now I'll even do this. I'm getting better. And I actually haven't caught myself today. It's like, I have not got it because I will never get it. So Ooh. the fact that now I wake up, Hey, I'm just going to make the best of this day I can. And then I have to try again tomorrow and try again tomorrow. I can never get ahead of myself. I can't get down on myself. Like it's a never ending. It's never going to stop till I die. It really isn't. Um, of trying to be better. You have to have a growth mindset. If I didn't have a growth mindset, dude, yeah, I would have been done yeah, playing hockey nice. like four years ago. Like yeah. four years ago, I would have been done. Like I am, yeah. but I, because I have that mindset and even with my mindset holding me back, I've still been able to progress because of my habits and all that stuff. But now it's like the key has been like really turned all the way unlocked by mind because it's not unlocked by saying I figured it out. I mastered it. It's unlocked by doing the opposite and being vulnerable and admitting that you're never going to get it. That's vulnerability. That's why we're trying to do this whole shift with hockey culture, with LGBT, uh, TQ, with racism, all this stuff. It's like vulnerability is the strength with, yeah. you know, that is the power. And if you're just going to sit there and be like, Oh, I'm tough. I don't get scared of fighting Reeves. I don't, I don't get scared of fighting these guys. Like, yeah, right. I get fired up. <laughs> I also know that, that's what makes it exciting. If I just knew I was going to go out and spank these guys, why, why would that be fun? I'd go play do MMA or something. I, yeah. I like that. I'm going to fail. That's going to teach me about myself. Failure is a prerequisite to everything. It's just trial, error, trial, error, trial, error. Oh, I got it. Oh, huge trial, fail, fail, fail <laughs> trial, error, trial, error. It's how it is. Yeah. Revolving circle that never ends. But you know, the growth mindset, I love that you touched on that because that's what ultimately everyone should be striving for is making sure that you know every single day you just get a little bit better and you talk about that right you know you spend you get a zillion touches on the ice this morning and you get two hours on the ice instead of one you know a lot of guys if they sign a contract they go celebrate for a week and you're you know you're doing the opposite right dude i used to i used to sit and like you know soak in oh my phone blowing up oh it's like dopamine hit dopamine hit oh my brain is just <laughs> loving it right I used to be like that and I just kind of clear my, not even clear my schedule. I just like not do much else and just sit here. And, but now like, this is the biggest shift. This is what I'm really pumped about. It's like, I have like an, I can't even so many messages and I haven't even scratched the surface. All I do is answer my mom, my girlfriend, my brother, my marketing guy, my skills guy, my close buddies I train with. And I just was like, in the past I would just shut down, but I was like, why would I change anything? Like my whole mindset and my positive energy and vibration I'm putting out is what brought me this contract. Why would I change anything now that I have it? It's like, if anything, it gets more intense. So I scheduled my day. It started at 6.15. It's, uh, you know, three, four to now will be done whenever next 20, 30 minutes. And then I'm going to be like, okay, now I can go and touch base with some people. Thank you so much. Get to a certain amount, maybe two hours of it back on the grind. Got to eat again. Got to, got to think about tomorrow. I've got to plan. I've got to call my girlfriend, you know, like that's, I'm just going to slowly chip away at it. And that's not, I used to think, Oh, I'm such a bad guy for Nancy. It's like, no, like this is my life. I know what I'm doing. I know my intentions. I don't have to worry about what people think about me. Just do me. It'll, everything will be fine. Yeah. Don't, uh, don't change what you're doing, man. It's, it's, it's super cool to see. And uh, you know, there aren't a lot of professional athletes that are out there sharing, doing advocating for these things so uh again kudos to you on it but uh how, how is that training you mentioned it is that three on three league going right now yeah so that's it's actually four on four but we can't talk oh. about it too much unfortunately because covid obviously and that kind of stuff so Fair um, enough. basically Fair enough. it's been very it's been very distant we are like we've had to follow a lot of protocols no uh, body con no no uh, no body oh, checking no breathing super, no face offs everyone's 10 feet away <laughs> it's super chill and uh yeah it's been going really well Fair, fair enough. I'll, uh, I'll, we'll table that one for next time. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so uh, we got some, a couple of questions on our Instagram, you know, trying to interact with our, our followers. Uh, one of them actually came from uh, your good buddy, Devin Rimmer Chuck. You know, I spent a, this, a couple of days this summer in his backyard uh, training with him. But um, <laughs> the backyard. <laughs> oh, man. Legendary backyard. We did everything back oh, there. It's, uh, it's we um, <clears throat> but uh, what his question for you is. Uh, who are your top five teammates that you've played with? And I think he was biased in hoping that he got into this list. Um, and, you know, <laughs> you don't have to necessarily go uh, name by name, but, uh, you know, are there guys that stand out to you that have been uh, inspirational and worked with you? Yeah, uh, I've said so many. It's funny how it, like, ebbs and flows because it's, like, recency bias, right? Like, you're with guys more recently. Uh, I'm trying to think of, like, the all-time bonds I've had with guys. So, um, uh, you know, doesn't usually – it's so many, though, like – 
there's got to be at least 30 guys that, you know, I wouldn't talk to them for a year, but then we talk and it's like, I literally saw him yesterday, right? Like everybody has those kind of friends. Uh, well, Hish is one, that. right? Hish at skills underscore corp, right? That's his Insta, I think. Skills corp. Yeah, Shout him yeah, out. You, yeah, but he, I, I mean, I played on the, I played on the team that first year, and he was like the do- most dominant player in the league, and I was a scrub, and he would chirp me and have fun. And we haven't, we didn't talk probably for eight, nine years, and now he's doing what he does now as skills coach, and we're like working together all the time. So he, he wouldn't even get on that list. We don't even get to that point yet. But I, I don't know who I would. I'm not gonna start start throwing people on, but it's. It's strange how I think people come in and out of your life for a reason, and uh, you know, like like Reimer, like Maids, you know, you know Binner. Let's just could keep going down the list, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it it comes and goes. Um, when, but you're always there for each other. Whether you know something's happening, it's like oh, you reach out. I'm always. I have so many guys that would want to reach out and just chat and vent as they know I'm kind of that guy now. So <laughs> that's how I kind of help like keep those relationships, I guess. But at the same time, when you start ascending, like and I've kind of keep breaking, breaking through prep plateaus lately. It's like your circle just keeps getting smaller, dude. Like mm. I have a very tight inner circle now that nobody can like touch. And it's, yeah. it's like five people. So I, I think you start to have too many, you can't have that many close relationships. You're too spread out. You got to have your core ones and then everybody else comes next. Man, from a biological level, human beings are not meant to have hundreds of thousands of friends. We are like, no. we are, we are very, primal in our primal state we have our family right essentially that's yeah. who you're supposed to be spending your yeah. time with and yeah. uh so it's uh it's interesting and you know now with social media there's a whole bunch of you know negatives that can come with it it's a tool at the end of the day right so as long as you, it is. depends on you can depends use on how you're you can using use, it you can use a hammer to kill somebody or build a house so it's yeah. just like you can uh if you're if somebody thinks oh social media is so bad social media is so bad it's like you're only focusing on the negatives bro like it's yeah. the amount of pauses are insane. And as I say, organically things have happened. I've, if I didn't play hockey, I would have been like a fitness slash bodybuilder got into a social media that way. I've always liked the social media thing. And now I've just organically come into it. And it's like not, no, no other athlete pretty much in hockey do what I do. Maybe PK Subban. Yeah. I mean, that's about it. That really, and I don't think any of them post as much stuff as I do at all. So it's like, no. I know I'm, there's definitely a method to my madness. Um, but it's, uh, man, it's so much fun doing it. It's, I don't know well, why you wouldn't embrace social media for the positives. Well, and it, it's, it's just you being real and who you are, right? At the end of the day. Yeah. So it makes it, it's easy. Um, it's funny. You mentioned that you would have been a huge fitness guy or something if you weren't a pro hockey player and you've started 100%. training, you started training the girlfriend, she's getting into it. And, uh, that was one of the things you said in your story. You're like, babe, if I, uh, if I, w- if I wasn't into hockey, I'd be just this huge shredded jacked guy. So, uh, you know what? Like like this. <laughs> yeah. For those who are uh, just listening, he's just grew his shoulders by about six inches either side. Eh? Dude, I would be huge. I would, I would still have lifted legs, but I'd have the most aesthetically possible body from my body type. I don't have an elite fitness <laughs> bodybuilding body type, but it would have been good for like an Instagram kind of brand kind of thing like that. But I would, I always tell her like, just, when I'm done playing, like I'm maybe a lift legs hard once a month just to maintain, <laughs> but I am going to just destroy my upper body. I am literally probably for the first six months just only going to do pull-ups, rear and um, and side delts, and like triceps and just build that like physique and just that taper. I want that taper. I have this huge like hockey core gut, whatever got going on for yeah. the strength. I want to build this shit out. <laughs> just there's the Curtis Gabriel uh, workout plan post NHL just massive upper body every day six days a week huge volume 3,500 calories minimum no di- yeah. no dairy no eggs good to go no I will be <laughs> even she thinks like you're so weird with food like you're so like hardcore and I'm like you have been, you don't even know yeah, yeah. I, you don't even know yet just wait till I'm done playing I'm gonna fast I'm gonna eat about 3,000 calories in a four hour span because I can gorge myself I get the benefits of you know, the cell regeneration, leaner, yeah. I could get, I feel like I'm stuffing my face and then I could be more productive with our kids, family life. It's like, their kids are going to know, it's like dinner time, dad's going to eat about four meals and then shut it off. <laughs> yeah. Dude, I love, intermittent fasting is the best. I, uh, it's funny that you mentioned like the, so I basically went in January, I was getting a little chunky and I said, you know, if I'm going to host <laughs> this athlete's podcast, I got to, you know, reap what I sow and be an athlete as well. So go. I went, there you go. Dropped about dropped about 20, 25 lbs. Uh, went down to about one eighty five. Started looking a little cleaner, you know. Um, 
but I, you know, now I'm at that point where I'm like, okay, a low enough body fat, I got to get, you know, the muscle back in there. Right. Um, but it, it's amazing. Like intermittent fasting is incredible and not a lot of people know about it, man. And it's oh, so dude. good. It's all the, everything is online. Like you have, nobody has any excuse. I don't know what to do. I need like, now that's coming for me. I, I do like working with the trainer and him telling me and takes the thinking out of my day, but you telling me you can't go online. This is how to do a squat go to the gym, get a cheat membership, squat, you'll get sore, come home. Okay, this is a deadlift. This is a pull up. Like, it is all there for you. You like, I get so sick of eating. And some people are just like, eating's like life. That's amazing. <laughs> when you eat crap, when you eat shit food every day, it starts to taste, there's no, what is good food anymore? Like it's, yeah. you, eat, you only eat pizza, you only eat this. When you intermittent fast, you get to earn that Saturday night, Oh my dude. God. You, uh, before I had started doing this thing, I was the Domino's train man. Oh my God, dude, that food, <laughs> that is, that is food. I don't care what anybody says. Oh, I eat that every day. It's so good. No, you don't get it. You don't get it. You get the health <laughs> benefits of fasting and looking amazing. And then you get to just crush with no guilt. Like if you're not living your life that way, I don't, you're doing it wrong, bro. Yeah. It's uh, it's awesome. I love it that uh, someone else is sharing those thoughts. Same as me. <laughs> um so a couple more questions i know you're a busy guy but uh we oh, we're good. you we're know good. One, one of the other insta questions came uh, from zach shabbat um and he asked about what was going through your head uh, during that time when you went uh, in that fight with vince dunn and then it goes into the <laughs> into the you know essentially that hallway because yeah. yep. which is a weird setup very unique yep. arena i'm assuming and it was yep. you guys are side by side basically walking the linesman yep. even held him up for an extra 20 seconds and uh you know yep. push came to shove you guys uh ended up throwing again in there what what was going through your head yeah so i like hey everything happens man there's uh when you play as emotional as i do like i've kind of almost resigned myself to the fact that stuff's just gonna i mean it's gonna happen hopefully nobody gets hurt and but that's why I play the game because it's so fun and unpredictable that way. So, uh, of course, we had to be playing in Chicago where it's the only place in probably pro hockey you leave the ice at the same spot with the other team. And the only thing yeah. that separates you is about eight feet of concrete. Um, so, I think we were losing like 3-1, 4-1. I hadn't played a shift in like 10 minutes. I was not happy. I went out with two minutes left. I got my pity shift, so I was even more unhappy. And uh, I was just burying everyone. And I, I hit done and he didn't like it. It was not late. He made a pass. He watched his pass. Oh, we're up 3-1. I'm going to watch my pass. I hit him hard and he didn't like it. He two-handed me. And I two-handed him. He dropped his – wait. Or did I – I freaking slapped him in the chest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chopped, yeah, yeah. Everybody thought it – It, it thought it was a high stick, yeah. It didn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. Um, and then he drops his stuff. And I'm like, perfect. I can't <laughs> wait. This is going to be Because he's a smaller but, guy. Oh, yeah. I mean, come on. I just, <laughs> dude, don't even. So, Wisniewski, he's got James Wisniewski, a former NHLer, as a D partner. The whole team jumps on me, including the linesman, and then Dunn just keeps to keep punching me because nobody's yeah. jumping on him. So, then at, nobody can see this at the bottom of the pile, literally at the bottom of the pile. I'm on my back, face up. My arms are – I can't move my arms. And he's, he punched me like Ugh. two times, I think, at the bottom of that pile, yeah. which is just gutless. Okay? That, yeah, so then, it's against the code. Like, it was just like, I couldn't defend myself. Um, so we get up, I'm losing my mind. They finally calm me down, tell me to get off. Uh, probably should have held us out. You know, obviously I didn't think it was going to happen. I go off first, way into my locker room, maybe like 50 feet down. And he decides to walk across the thing. And I guess he's still mad. And he starts beaking me from out there, which they don't show. And yeah. then I was just, I had a little snap show. Uh, yeah. I don't do that often. And I came out and I walked across the concrete. And I had full intent to like, like I, I had in my head for a split second, like I've never been a fight off the ice. So I was thinking I was just going to football tackle him before anybody could get there and like ground and pound him. And that would have been awful. Like I, as soon as I sit that concrete on my skates, instead of like going into like a football tackle, I was like concrete, concrete in my mind. It's just like, you're going to go to jail. Like, what are you doing? Like, you yeah. can't, you can't do this. And I've never been in a fight. My mom's a teacher. I was like the goody good kid. Nobody would probably think that, but I grabbed on and I was just like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to scare him. I'm here now. I'm not going to throw a punch. Let's scare him. So I grabbed his thing and I just shook him. And I was like, you like calling him, whatever. You're just think you're so sick, blah, blah, blah. And good for him. He got scared. He took an opportunity and he threw a bomb and he got me, <laughs> cut me open. And um, I was like, I couldn't believe it was happening. You know, 
I get the six game suspension because it goes viral. He gets nothing. It was, it was terrible, but uh, you know, that's great. He's a skilled player. He gets to play his role. He took advantage of the opportunity. I'm the guy that has to do this kind of situations all the time and fight. Stuff's going to happen. Lost my cool. I'm just really proud. I didn't, I mean, I had a good 10 second window to do a lot of bad things and I didn't. And my mom was like, she would have not have been happy if I did that. So I'm quite happy I didn't. Yeah, for sure. And like, my mom's a teacher. So I have, I have the same kind of, you know, parent overhead thing. Yeah. You've got that in your sitting on your shoulder. Here. You're like, okay, I can't do yeah. this, right? I, no. Um, <clears throat> but you know, good decision. Long, thinking of long term. That's one of the things you got to be cognizant of, right? Is as an enforcer or as that role guy. Um, you know, now you, you, for instance, you play with Noel, you hit Nolan Patrick, you get that one game suspension because it's your first, like your first offense. Can't, can't, and then he comes and blindsides you. Dude, I don't don't even, that, even, but, yeah, we're going yeah, yeah, to yeah, talk but, about the blindside part because it's people are never going <laughs> to, anyway, yeah. I'm going to talk about that one one day. But no, you, like, you're right. I've never, that was the first time I've ever been suspended for a hit. And you know why it got to that boiling point? It's because. We've been just hitting each other all game. Radko Gudis hits my other – one of my buddies I put on that list, potentially Kevin Rooney, and I go and crush him back and just say, let's fight. And he goes, no. So if you want to, like, let off steam, that's what has to happen. That if guys get in a fight, the, the energy like, – like, the emotional energy, and guys will play hard, but the, the, the physical will tone down at least a bit in today's hockey. So he didn't crack that bottle cap off and let the pressure off. I come flying off the bench and, you know, I committed to it. It was too late. I, I truly and honestly, you people don't think it, I had let up. If I had hit him like I wanted to, I would have turned around swinging. If I knew it was a clean hit, I would have been swinging, just going eight, like crazy, right? Yeah. So I, I just knew I was like, guys, I, I literally look at the ref. I'm like, dude, he turned a quarter enough that he was not able to get hit anymore. I know that. I'm standing over him. I'm mm -hmm. looking, Jeru and all these guys end up going to training camp with, they're like, what are you doing? I'm like, dude, come on. Like, you think I would be talking to you right now if I meant to do that? Like, I'd, I'd yeah. just go chill. Yeah. Um, so I've never had that before. But yeah, those, those things happen, man. It sucks that I had to have one of them, but I plan not to have another one. But the only time you're trying to hurt people, I, I was, I say, you're in a fight, you're trying to, you're trying to diminish that guy's chance of hurting you. You got to hurt him. That's just, I don't care what anybody says. That's what it is. That's why it's a real fight. It's not a joke. Yeah. Um, but the yeah. hitting, it's like, no, you're just trying to make that guy quit. I'm not trying to hurt people. I'm just trying to just make them make it so hard that they don't want to play against me because I'm going to come every shift, no matter what, every time I'm going to finish my check with full intent on you. So it's always going to, that's what makes hockey so great, but there's always a good and bad side to that. Yeah. And that, it, so the, to lead it, to lead into that, how do you feel about people who want to take hit, fighting out of the NHL or for instance right now with the OHL saying no 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 body checking like what, what are your thoughts I'm curious yeah so I, I made it my girlfriend played high level junior hockey we talked about it Stud know, goaltender always, we might have to get her on the athletes podcast you know oh well, she she would never she's so <laughs> nervous to talk no way uh, I've tried to get her on some things but uh no it's like it's it's uh <clears throat> that's not men's hockey anymore like I, yeah. you know I'm not saying it's not hockey because women play without it. And that's great. And there are women that wish they could, I had girlfriends, friends petition to have body checking. If I have a daughter and she wants to check, I'll be the guy that changes that for sure. By the way, I'll be nice. like all over it. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, I just, I just, it's not the same sport. So yeah, it's one year, not a big deal. It'll go back to it, but it better go back to it. I mean, like, mm -hmm. And, and there's no way there should ever be any limit of fighting in the NHL. That's what keeps it somewhat sane. The, the emotions and the stakes are so high. If you take that or limit it, it's just going to become a joke. It's going to be who can headhunt each other more. That's what it's going to turn into. You won't have enforcers. You'll have guys that can skate like the wind and just hit people that don't, and don't care about anything else. That's what'll, that'll be the new thing. Just intimidation yeah. by hitting, right? Which is way more dangerous than fighting. I don't care what anybody says. Like five, four percent of concussions come from fighting. Like, of course, it, it can happen, but very rarely. Okay, um, but yeah, that's there's no way they already have a ten fight rule in the AHL. They have the three in the OHL, which is a joke. The Q is I think <laughs> ten now, and the dub is like wide open, I think. But all you're doing is having guys coming up not knowing how to fight. Then you get them put in the NHL, and you have me going after them. So I don't know what you want because it's. I always say like if I can get up there. I'm 27. Some of these guys are older reasons. If I could stick around a bit, you know, there's going to be just no one to compete with. Like I'll just yeah. be just terrorizing people. It cracks yeah. me up to think about, but 
Um, you're just preparing guys to not know what to do. If I didn't go to the OHL and get beat up 10 times, I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, yeah, and that's where I kind of um, – that's where I stand too. I'm like, man, you're delaying the inevitable. If there's going to be fighting in the NHL, then why not have them prepare as, you know, young adults, right? Essentially, we're, we're all getting to basically yeah. our full, full size at 17, yeah. 18, 19. Uh, I don't know. I don't like it. Um, but Curtis Gabriel, the last way we wrap up all these podcasts is talking about what pieces of advice would you give to the next generation of athletes? You know, with the athletes podcast here, I'm trying to create just a forum for athletes to come together, learn from different sports, different kinds of athletes. What would be your uh, piece of advice to give to that next gen? Do not identify with your sport. It's the worst thing that could possibly happen. And I, I, I preface that by saying that's my journey. I'm sure guys have gone from uh, having to do it the other way, probably have to care more, need to identify with it yeah. more. You've got to figure out what's, but whatever, whatever it is, you cannot associate your being with what you do. I don't care if it's sport, job, anything. That is, we need to stop as a society, uh, you know, putting on a pedestal success and money. We need to start talking about happiness and fulfillment. And that's where real stuff happens, man. And that's what makes the world a better place. So for me, disassociating as that as I'm a person that plays hockey instead of a hockey player is a massive change for me. And it's going to unlock my potential. I truly believe. And if it doesn't great, I have all these other great things to do. So it's a win, win. I could care less at this point. I want to win a Stanley cup. I want to play in the NHL. I want to stay. I played a full year, made it a camp or whatever, but at the end of the day, I'm going to be okay because I'm a good person with good values, with good people around me. And I work hard to be a good person. So it's life's gravy now. Dude, I, uh, I love it. I love your energy. It's so cool. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to have an honor and an honor to have you on really. And uh, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to do this. Uh, the newest member of the San Jose Sharks organization. Again, congratulations on the contract signing. And uh, we'll, we'll chat again, man, once you, uh, once you continue to wreak havoc in the NHL. I appreciate it, man. And, and I always say this too now. It's become like just organically happened too. When I speak to guys like you, uh, it's, that's what I like to do because you're someone who does probably works and works out has all these things on the go and then does a podcast as a passion project. Like those are my kind of people. If you're not living your life that way, I just truly think you're missing out and you're missing the boat. And if that, if you hear that and you're an athlete, it's like, all I do is play hockey and video games. It's like, no, <laughs> that is not okay. If you're truly happy and you can tell me with like a, I don't know how you can't ever really know, then all ha you know, go for it. But, there is a lot more to life than these things, man. So uh, I love talking with you. That's why I'm able to vibe with people like you so easy. You just know what I'm thinking. You know what? I, it's, it's awesome. So keep doing you, man. It's awesome. Appreciate it. We'll, uh, we'll have you on again in the future once you start potting those goals here for San Jose and uh, we'll have some fun. Sounds good, man. Appreciate it, Dave. And thanks to uh, your producer too, uh, Jordan. <laughs>